What's up, party people? Hey, it's Dr. Buck, and I'm back with another video. This is the beginning of a series that I'm gonna call What to Do When. When I was working as an emergency and trauma surgeon for 10 years, we saw a lot of patients that would get to the ER or hospital at a very late stage in whatever it is. Could be a flu, cancer, appendicitis, doesn't matter. But what happens is when you seek medical attention so late in the disease process, it complicates things hundredfold. So if you can seek medical attention at the appropriate time or as in early, then it's a lot easier on you, on <laughs> us, and on the whole system in general. A lot of the money spent in the healthcare system in the United States is treating like late stage disease, except a lot of times the only thing we can do is sort of treat the symptoms and not really fix the whole problem. So this is why I wanna do this series. Hopefully it'll help you guys. I'm gonna start with some pretty easy stuff. So eventually we'll get into a lot of emergency general surgery and trauma things and stuff like that. First, I wanna do like the big top tens. So the first one is what to do when somebody has a cold or flu, but not just what to do, but how do you know if it's bad enough that you need to seek medical attention like urgent care or ER or your family physician? In a cold or flu, you should have runny nose, headache, congestion, a little wheezing maybe, something like that, but not difficulty breathing. How do you know what's difficulty in breathing? So labored breath, our normal kind of breath rate is about 10 to 15 per minute. If you're over that, like 17, 20, 25, 30, that's probably a problem. This is really important, especially for people who are elderly and have multiple comorbidities or morbidly obese. So those are the three categories that I'm probably gonna repeat a lot. Elderly, multiple comorbidities, as in hypertension, diabetes, asthma, like multiple problems problems, kidney failure, heart failure, all those things, right? Pulmonary failure. Those are very sick people. And a funny thing we used to say all the time was kind of like, that person probably can't tolerate a haircut because we were surgeons. We we're like, can we operate on this person? Can we cut this person, right? I don't know. They have this, but I don't think this person can even tolerate a haircut, let alone a surgery. Sort of funny jokes that surgeons make. What I really recommend, especially if you have somebody in your home or close to you in one of those three categories, you should get a pulse oximeter. Just a little teeny thing that fits on your finger that tells you you what the oxygen saturation in your blood is. It's very cheap. They're like on Amazon. We'll put a link or something somewhere. Super easy. You slap it on your finger. And if your pulse rate is over 100 and your breathing is high and your oxygen saturation is low as in less than 92%. So 92% is a very, very important number because less than that means that you have a serious decrease in oxygen saturation in your blood. So from like 92 to 99, it's really not that big of a change. But once you hit 92, you start to have a serious problem. So 90, 89, 88, that's a big deal, especially in somebody who has multiple comorbidities, morbidly obese, or is elderly because those are the high risk patients, right? Even if you aren't a high risk patient and your oxygen saturation is in the 80s somewhere and you're difficulty breathing and you have a cold or flu, then you should go see somebody. So that's number one. Number two is high fever. If you have a fever over 103, 100.4 and over, we kind of consider a fever in surgery if if you've had an operation and you're more than a couple days out and you have over 100.4, we might start to think like you have a bacterial infection from the surgery or something involving the surgery. But if you have a cold or flu and you have over 103 fever for any period of time, that could be a serious problem. What that typically tells us is that you might have a secondary and bacterial infection because cold and flu is really just typically it's a virus. Viruses are usually self-limiting in these situations and it's like typical cold and flu thing. But if you have a secondary bacterial infection and you're at a high risk, or even if you're not a high risk person, you might have more problems coming. So you want to go in sooner than later if you hit 103 temperature or over. Okay, number three, dehydration. Dehydration seems like a simple problem, but in certain people, it can be a big deal. Also, when you get sick enough and you don't feel well and you lay there for an extended period of time, then you can get so dehydrated with, with a cold and flu that you can have damage to your kidneys. So you don't wanna do that obviously. What happens with dehydration is your blood volume gets depleted and you start sort of shunting away the blood or the oxygen and you kind of like pull it into your main organs like your brain, your heart and things like that. But you start to damage other things. So the skin, the kidneys, the gut, things like that can get damaged from dehydration. And dehydration may not take very long time. If you don't drink anything for like two, three days, then you can be very dehydrated. Signs of dehydration are very dark urine, sunken 
eyes, dry mouth, dizziness, fatigue, all those things. What we do like in the ER, I always check somebody, I check their finger, I just pinch it like this to turn white and come back red real quick or pink. Then we know they're pretty well perfused. If you're super dehydrated and you're starting to get sick, you may not have peripheral perfusion like that. And so if you just grab somebody's finger, pinch it up, oh, it's still white for like two, three seconds. That might be a problem. So you might have sign of dehydration. Okay, number four is if you have worsening symptoms. Typical cold and flu should be around 48, 72 hours, maybe four days, five days, but you should be getting better at that time. If you're not seeing an improvement in 48 to 72 hours, then you probably should see someone. Obviously those people that are at a higher risk, you wanna be more vigilant about that. So if it's like 48 hours and they're still getting worse, you're like, probably take that person in. But if you're young, healthy, don't have any medical problems, you're not feeling great, but it's like no worse, no better than yesterday, you might wanna give it another day or so. But if you're continuing to get worse at 72 hours or even four days, then you definitely wanna go and see somebody. Remember, sooner than later saves a lot of problems, a lot of hassle, a lot of money for you and for the system and all that stuff. So definitely wanna do that. So number five is actually just any person with chronic medical condition. Like I talked about, elderly, morbidly obese, and multiple comorbidities or chronic conditions, right? Hypertension, diabetes, asthma, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, even low grade kidney failure, heart failure, all those things. Not only do you wanna make sure those patients go in early, if they get a cold or flu, and they just don't look right, sometimes that is a good enough test to say this person needs to go see somebody. And I'll tell you a story. Basically, when I was a younger resident, you know, you go in, you do all these numbers, you check everything, and you look in the chart, looking at the x-rays, and looking at that, and look at this, and you're like, I don't know what's wrong with this patient, or I don't know what exactly is going on. And then you take them to a senior resident, and they'd, they'd say like, what's going on? Is the patient sick or not sick? And you're like, oh, well, I don't really know. Like these numbers, some of them are good, and some of them are bad, and blah, blah, blah. And the senior resident would say, what are they look like? Do they look sick? One of the first things you kind of learn is to walk into a patient's room and look at them and say, well, do they look sick or not sick? This is what I always used to teach the younger residents when they're coming on, like first year or second year or whatever. You walk into the ER, especially like with a trauma. If somebody gets uh, shot or they get in a car accident or whatever it is, this is what we usually got called the ER for, not for cold and flu, but seen a lot of that too. So I walk in there, I look at the patient and say, are they sick or not sick? Is the patient gonna die in an hour or are they not gonna die in an hour? And then the second question to me, because I was a surgeon is, okay, if they're sick, do they need an operation or do they not need an operation? If they don't need an operation, then the medical team is gonna take care of it. So I get a lot of questions from friends and family, like, hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? First thing I do is assess the patient, look at them and say, are they sick, not sick? Because the numbers in the charts, they don't always tell the story. And so you have to put everything together. One time my senior resident, I was looking at the x-ray, and she, she grabbed the x-ray and threw it. You're gonna treat the x-ray? You're gonna hook the EKG up to the x-ray? You're gonna do surgery on the x-ray? No, this x-ray is not the patient. Look at the damn patient and see what is going on with the patient. Then you take the x-ray and put it together with the patient. But if the patient's fine, you maybe not need the x-ray. And this is one thing that happened a lot with the CAT scans when CAT scans got really good is that the patient is totally fine, but we'd find something else. You find a significant finding or an insignificant finding. And then you're like, what the hell we do with this? Because now this patient's fine and now they have this finding. But in the olden days, we would have seen this patient, done some x-rays, never found this thing. They probably would have never had a problem. But now we have this thing where we have to tell them, hey, you have this little mass that's on your adrenal gland. It's so small that we wouldn't do anything with it, but now we gotta tell you what it is. Now you gotta follow up. So all these different things happen. So look at the patient, see how they're doing. If they look like, take it to the ER. All right, you guys, hey, thanks for watching this video. Hope you enjoyed it. I will see you in the next video. If you like the video, like the video. If you think it would help somebody else, please share it. And if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe to the channel. It helps us out a lot. And I'll see you in the next one.